Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth George, Director of Member Engagement and Chapter Development with the American Guild of Organists. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our first webinar of 2021, How We Worship the Ever-Changing Environment. Before we start, I always like to go over a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, this is being recorded and probably within 24 hours, we will have uploaded it onto the AGO website. You will be able to find it under the education tab. We have a subpage that says AGO past webinars and supporting documents, and it will be there. You are muted, but we do wanna hear from you throughout this presentation. I would ask that you use the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of your screen to post questions. Do not post them in the chat box. If we've got them in Q&A, they will be saved. If we can't uh, answer all of your questions, we know we'll be able to after this webinar and we can post them along with the recording. So uh, let's get started. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our illustrious panelists. Matthew Burt is coordinator of the 2024 AGO National Convention that will be taking place in San Francisco. He's a former counselor for the AGO West region. He holds degrees in theology and music from Oxford, Harvard, and Boston universities, and currently lives in Palo Alto. He has served three Bay Area Episcopal parishes and over the past 16 years, and is currently music director at Transfig Transfiguration Episcopal Church in San Mateo. David Enlow is an organist and choir master of the Church of the Resurrection, as well as music director at the Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City. David has taught for local, regional, and national events of the National Guild of Organists, the Royal Canadian College of Organists, and also at Juilliard School, from which he received two degrees. And David, I just wanna say a special thank you to all the wonderful workshops you've done and continue to present uh, during this time of the pandemic. You have been a, a lifesaver for many of our chapter programs. Uh, David also received first prizes from the Albert Schweitzer Organ Festival and the Arthur Poister Competition and has recently serves, served as a judge for several others, including AGO's National Competition on Improvisation. Megan King serves as Director of Music Ministries and Organist at St. John the Baptist in uh, Church in Corpus Christi. She earned her bachelor's degree in sacred music with a concentration in piano performance at Ave Maria University in Naples. She earned her Master of Music in Sacred Music and Organ Performance at Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey, and Doctor of Musical Arts from the University of California. Actively involved in the AGO, Megan has served on the board of the Los Angeles chapter, and we are very pleased to have her serving as Dean of the Corpus Christi chapter. Alex Oldroyd serves as Director of Music and Organist at the Corpus Christi Cathedral. As a collaborative pianist, choir director, Alice, Alex has worked with many churches, schools, community choirs as a musician and director. He's been active for a long time with the AGO and has served as sub-dean and dean of the Salt Lake City chapter. And uh, also uh, is, was a co coordinator of the 2017 AGO West Convention. And I'm very pleased to announce that he was recently appointed as um, the South, well, actually West Region uh, District Convener for the AGO. And as a side note, Alex is married to Megan and is the proud father of Kyler and Sophie. Last but not least, Leslie Wolf Robb has served as Director of Music Ministries for St. Paul's Lutheran Church and School in San Diego since 1985. She teaches piano and organ to both children and adults. Many of her students have gone on to study music at the university level, and a number of them currently serve as church musicians and recognized performers. She has presented oh, so many workshops for the AGO on teaching young organists, 
developing scholarship programs, chapter development and leadership at the local, regional, and of course, national levels. She currently serves on the National Council as Secretary and Counselor for Communications. Um, Leslie is also going to be serving as our moderator today. But before I turn this over to Leslie, she recently sent me a link uh, that I'd like to send to you. It was featured on a local television station, and I think it really sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. in the strangest of times. As the months progressed, it became even more clear that this was a long, long haul. Valenzuela has played the organ here at All Souls Episcopal Church in Point Loma thousands of times, but now he plays to an empty church with only microphones listening. Valenzuela is the director of music and the organist here. What's been taken away is the very thing that we're usually doing, that is performing. So, like many churches all over the world, he moved the music, organ and choir, into the virtual space. He calls those early online days the Jurassic period. But over time, with safety in mind, changes were made. The end product got better. things started to kind of refine themselves. Okay, we can get some people in here in the building, which gives us a proper acoustic, which means that we, we can use the organ, uh, which means that, okay, I, I think we could, um, the product could be, um, that would be better if we had lights, so somebody donated lights. Um, and, and little by little, the church became essentially a recording studio for the week-to-week -week church. <laughs> Well, Leslie Wolf Rob, I am going to uh, turn the uh, microphone over to you uh, and we'll get started. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you to the rest of our panelists here today. It's good to be with all of you, even though it's online. I feel like that's the way we spend most of our time with people nowadays. It's going to be very interesting when we can actually gather in person again. And I'd like to start out uh, with a question for all of our panelists. What was the most challenging part about pivoting to do worship differently? It's hard to imagine that just a year ago, if we'd been talking about last Sunday's worship service, we would have been talking about worship in person with people singing in the congregation and, and fellowship afterwards, coffee and donuts, all of those things. Um, and our choir's there with us. And for most of us, that's been quite different for almost a year now. So what was the most challenging thing for you? Matthew? Sure, thank you, Leslie. And it's great to see so many people on this webinar, over 200. Um, I just wish we could be in person, as you said. Um, I think the biggest challenge actually to follow on from that is maintaining a sense of community. Um, there's you know, and at the same time, producing the quality of music that we'd like to. I think the there are amazing technological solutions to some of the challenges we've been presented with, but they will lack something. So, you know, the, the, the most interactive solutions such as Zoom, you know, you have a ne necessarily um, lesser quality of audio or lesser quality of video or both. Um, and the, you know, the better, perhaps the better options in terms of musical quality, such as recording and streaming, um, you know, lack that sense of in interaction that we, uh, you know, we so enjoy about the experience of being together in a, in a religious environment. So that's been the biggest uh, challenge for me, I would say. David, uh, I know you're in New York and that's kind of, for most of us, we saw so much on television early on in the pandemic about, just how hard hit New York was. What what was most challenging for you? Well, it's true. In in April, uh, you know, things were pretty dire uh, in the city, and uh, I unusually had both my institutions going all the way through uh, streaming worship. Uh, I'd, I'd say that 
one interesting thing that's a challenge that that might not have been considered all the way around is is in planning things we're so used to planning cumulatively you know we've done it this way before for you know we've done these five things for these particular reasons and just just within a couple of weeks to try to think there's no reason to do any of those things <laughs> it was very uh challenging we sort of had uh you know all sorts of assumptions just had to be tossed away in in and in the case of my institutions and i think churches generally uh, uh places that rely on their traditions very heavily and 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 the customs are are enshrined so the 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 uh the difficulty of either trying to recreate uh, the the traditions and customs of a place uh, in a virtual medium or or to realize which ones were really uh, possible to, to set aside was was probably the a hurdle I thought was interesting through that process. Megan and Alex, I know you're both in Corpus Christi area where things have been a little easier because there have been far fewer cases there. Um, one or both of you tell us a little bit about what it's been like there. Alex, it looks like you won in the unmuting competition. <laughs> it's a race. Well, thank you, Leslie. And, and it is nice to be with all of you and, and see several friends and colleagues in the attendees uh, box. So hello to all of you. And, and like Matthew, I wish we could be in person. Um, I, I was just thinking back to the early part of, of this whole ordeal and going through some uh, pictures, which I'll, I'll maybe share later from the cathedral and, and what worship actually looked like. But I think, um, you know, one of my biggest challenges, I won't speak for, uh, for Megan, because our, our programs and churches are, are different, even though we're in the same place. But um, I was looking back through my uh, choir sign-in sheet from March 15th, which was our, our last rehearsal and had uh, 25 to 30 people who signed in there. We uh, Corpus Christi on March 15th was the largest city in the United States not to have a confirmed case. And so we were we were very late, you know, in in that respect. Um, I don't think we had a confirmed case in our county until around March 20th. And um, but that, you know, that week, that Sunday was our our sort of beginning of the lockdown and sort of a preemptive effort. And so, uh, you know, the loss of momentum was challenging for us uh, in, you know, rebuilding a program, a choral program here at the cathedral. Um, that loss of momentum, which represents, a, you know, loss of community and a loss of sort of the tradition that, that everyone was used to, um, but still having to keep that in sort of a, a normative way because uh, we we didn't have to pivot to live streaming in the same way that many others did because our our principal mass was already televised. So we we had a, a sort of head start in thinking about you know broadcasting and stuff because that was already happening. Um, but you know keeping that in in a normal way to fill that time because the TV time didn't change, but all of a sudden the cathedral's empty, so there's no reason to have a a four or five minute offertory piece while they're covering the baskets, but we still needed that time length, even though the cathedral's empty. So just sort of the, you know, unusual things that, that to think about um, would be one of our, our biggest challenges here. Megan, how about you? Megan's experience was, was different than that. So I don't wanna shut her out either. Our, our masses had not been live streamed before this. Um, and when things first shut down all the way, um, no one was allowed in the church period. Um, so the first few Sundays I went over to uh, my priest's uh, like home chapel and he would offer mass and I'd be just off camera, like chanting everything, just myself, just the two of us. So it was <laughs> interesting to kind of pick out and plan for that. And then, that's sort of how it started before we started rebuilding. So that was the biggest difference. It was all me after that, so. One of the things that was interesting for, for my congregation, our test run of live streaming, because we'd been working towards being able to do that, was the Sunday before lockdown. Um, we had just gotten everything in place to do it and thankfully had volunteers to run things and, and it went quite well. And I think 
uh, one of the biggest challenges and one of the things that I've had to adapt to learning to do is all the information that the tech people need in order to do this. They need to know how long is the prelude? What instrument are you using? Piano, organ, um, is there a, a cantor singing? And uh, having to plan not only that, but also making sure that the music that I selected would be covered under our live streaming agreements, all of a sudden makes life really interesting if you tend to have an eclectic library with some things that are not too mainstream, uh, it can make it an interesting thing. Uh, and I think one of the other challenges I really found was that what my choirs always had a really strong community and really enjoys being together. Of course, we haven't been together in person since March, but several of them are, have no capability of getting on something like Zoom. And so they've missed out on some of the fellowship time. Uh, people still call them, you know, occasionally they're stopped by church for our outdoor worship, but the loss of community has been really challenging. Um, I mentioned, you know, some of the challenges of the tech stuff with nuts and bolts, and I know we saw with Ruben that they found, oh, they needed lights, they needed microphones, or there's some other nuts and bolts things that any of you wish you had known before this that would have helped to make that transition smoother. Matthew? I know you've been doing prime, almost exclusively worship on Zoom. Yeah, that's true. And, and, you know, at first we actually live streamed and then because the congregation just felt it was such a sterile experience, um, you know, unable to interact, you know, we, we went, we moved into a Zoom um, model because we have a requirement in our diocese that the only, there's a small bubble of people who are allowed to be in the building to be recorded at once. It's basically me, two singers, two clergy and our youth minister and that's it. So it meant there was no possibility of any lay leadership if at all if we carried on um, live streaming so we moved on to zoom pretty quickly I'd say one thing I'm sure many of you have figured this out already getting a good microphone is really important and understanding the settings of your microphone and where to position it um, and the other thing you know when you're using zoom so much um, especially if you're trying to sing or play the piano over zoom or sometimes play the organ actually over zoom sometimes I'll zoom from the church um about once a month you know really practice find someone you trust and actually practice and put the microphone in different settings try all the different original sound settings fixed volume versus non-fixed volume because those things make a world of difference alex i know your space is uh quite large where you are what about any technical things or was that pretty much a moot point because you've been televising for so long uh, you know i was just thinking that i uh i think the microphone sit uh you know settings understanding the types of microphones that there are and the placements and the kinds of um you know what the sound field looks like on the microphones and and all those different things i knew a little bit about but it we have sort of a uh, a system that's there already but it's designed for you know a large choir who's packed in a, a set configuration and um and then there are some microphones that are further back in the uh you know in the sanctuary that capture sort of the ambient acoustic and and we have a control team in a separate you know control booth who mixes all that sound, um, but but the production aspect totally changed when we started live streaming everything that we did, not just mass, but uh, we live streamed vespers and we started doing uh, some limited streaming of funerals and um, you know these additional things and. And it, it does generate a lot of additional questions and things you have to think of, of um, you know, if you only have a quartet, in our case, the, the great division is exposed right in the center over the top of the choir. And so, um, you know, it's not using a lot of, of stuff on the great in registrations with the choir to balance, um, even though the, um, you know, our quartet was mic'd pretty close uh, with some, we had large diaphragm condenser mics for the 
the technically minded folks out there that that we positioned sort of one on each side and then a, uh, there was some hanging mics in the center but um, you know things that affect registration or um, exactly how you place things or you know maybe if you have not quite balanced or some singers are stronger than others you kind of you know it, it's just a lot of week to week technical changes and additional things you have to think about. Megan or David, any um, nuts and bolts things that you discovered in this that would be that you think others would benefit from knowing? Uh, microphones again, uh, just to, I'm sure that's the same for every single person. Uh, for me specifically, uh, our organ, it's a, it's a Rogers and it's plugged directly into the sound system. And um, so coming across on live stream, pick up the organ perfectly, but none of my singers. And so trying to adjust for that was just crazy. And then that really made you think about what does it sound like in the room week to week too. So I feel like, I, yes, I wish I'd known more about that, but also I'm kind of glad we did figure it out. So now that going forward in person, that'll be something to work with. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd extend that microphone comment uh, farther out too. I, I have a sort of odd experience that I have a, a very big synagogue and a very small church. And and so the in the church side, I am the IT manager. <laughs> and so I ended up with really good advice, I thought, you know, uh, choosing which equipment to buy. And I tried to get away cheap on the video switcher. And I tried to get away uh, with uh, a couple of, of you know, uh, sort of lesser components. And I've ended up buying the system twice. And, and so what I learned from that was that it, it, and we didn't know at the time, of course, that it was going to be nine and 12 months of, of streaming. We thought it would be maybe a little experiment for a month or two. Uh, but if, if we had just done it properly the first time, we could have avoided uh, extra expense and, and fooling around. Um, the synagogue was already streaming services and, and had a full-time technical director and, and a you know, part-time tech staff of about 10. So that they were already ready for that and they invested further in camera upgrades and that sort of thing. But uh, I, I could have used some of that, uh, that kind of thinking on the other side. Yeah, I know, I know I can remember at the beginning, David, when you say that we thought this would only go a couple of months, I can remember conversations with my with our pastor saying, okay, you know, the first Sunday that we're back, it doesn't look like we're going to make it for Easter, but the first Sunday that we're back, we're going to have Easter again so that we can have it all in person. When I think that, as they say, that ship has sailed, we're not, that's not going to happen. Um, here in San Diego, Southern California, we're still worshiping outdoors. We're not supposed to have indoor worship. So the indoor service is live stream only with me on an Allen organ and a cantor and the pastor preaching and one lay leader reading a scripture. And then our 8.30 a.m. service is outdoors, which has been an interesting experience. Um, one of the things that we uh, we're thankful for that was rather unusual to be thankful for is that the older portable keyboard that we had uh, started having issues so we got to get rid of that which was very nice and get something with weighted action and I now play on Sunday mornings at 8 30 smiling because it's such a much more positive and pleasant experience. I think my most creative nuts and bolts challenge solution was dealing with Christmas Eve because we did two services outdoors in San Diego in the winter time can be kind of windy and we had a string quartet come and I was concerned what's going to happen with music stands if we're out there and the wind comes up not only is the music going to go but is the stand going to tip over and crash so I ordered three sets of 10 pound ankle weights off Amazon and strapped ankle weights on the bottom of each music stand and I'm happy to report that everything stayed in place really well and uh you know, I don't know that we'll ever need them again. Perhaps we can loan them out to people for exercise purposes, but it was a nice, nice solution and it worked very well. And Christmas Eve outdoors at night in, in San Diego was really pretty magical. We even had a snow machine bringing snow down from the second level of our school. And, and that was really magical for the kids. And uh, it was, it, 
I, I wouldn't mind doing that again. And I didn't think I'd ever say that that sounded like a good idea. I really miss being indoors uh, and, and getting to have everybody sing. You know, we have, um, oh, we have some questions. Question. We do uh, for those of you who live stream and record with a couple of singers, how do you handle the optics of having them sing with masks, even though they may be in the building well distanced from a limited number of other people? Do you dare not use masks? So I can briefly say, because we, we, we do do that, because we have a stable bubble. And Elizabeth, while I'm speaking, maybe you could make me a co-host so I could just briefly share. Um, because we have a stable bubble, our guidelines do permit anyone speaking or singing to remove their mask to do so. So, and the, you know, so this is an example of something we would play through a Zoom, um, you know, through Zoom on a regular Sunday. But of course, we record it in the in the context of the service, and you can just see sort of the setup we have. So yeah, as you can see, we have the singers really well spaced and we and the cameraman are the only people in the building at the time. So, um, you know, we've been cautious to, uh, you know, take as many precautions as we can. I have a couple of other questions. Um, could you talk more about the best virtual practices for Zoom or remote choir rehearsals? Please also speak to what will not work given the latency issues. Anybody want to tackle that one? I mean, we I know we've had, you know, some wonderful technology webinars about uh, uh, vocal, putting together vocal tracks and all of that, but if anybody wants to comment on that. Okay, let's go on to the other question. Um, are, any of you finding that having choirs standing far apart is working all right? Well, I think Matthew just uh, was able to answer that. Um, I have a friend that's singing uh, in a church. She's part of a quartet on the Upper East Side and they're wearing the masks. They hate them, but they're distanced so that they are, I think they're six feet apart and it's, it's working. Um, but, you know, um, from my church, uh, St. Paul's, which is a small Episcopal church down in Delray Beach. Um, I mean, the diocese has just been so, so strict. Only one person in there. Uh, everybody's masked until they have to say something or sing. I, for the most part, was watching services online because as a former singer, I at least I could sing with them from the kitchen if I was watching the service online. I went back for the first time this past Sunday and I enjoyed it. There were probably 10 people in, in, in the service, the 10 o'clock service that was also live streamed. Um, and I, I did hum, I didn't sing, but I did hum. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hearing that humming is, is safe. Uh, I, I want to answer the question about um, uh, is distance working? And and I can relate it back to the Zoom question too, actually. Um, in, in the church, we have a diocesan regulation that uh, any singing, which is not recommended, uh, has to be 12 feet apart with masks. And so for ensemble, that presents uh, quite a bit of difficulty. You can imagine the finer points of consonants are also almost completely lost. And uh, so there's and the, the thing I'm trying to explain to singers most of the time is not to have an audio sense of ensemble, but a visual ensemble. In other words, to be with the director directly and disbelieving their ears, which is sort of the uh, playing the organ in the gallery, accompanying a singer down front uh, uh, sort of uh, experience, but for singers who have not often done that. Um, in, in about the Zoom thing, the uh, I think the answer for Zoom specifically is that it does not work for rehearsals. Uh, uh, except people have make make a you know they'll make a track for the background or something, but the latency uh, that's built into the the, the program won't, won't allow for ensemble music. Um, but uh, in the uh, the other thing about about masks showing the synagogue had a, a sort of interesting uh, pivot on that. At first, they were not going to show the singing with masks because it was felt it it you know sort of reflected pandemic. Uh, 
ethos to the to the worship instead of uh, worship service. But then they realized it was showing that that uh, everybody involved was being safe and taking it seriously. And so the showing of, of the masked singing sort of was was something that they decided to emphasize. A couple more questions here. Um, a comment from Steve Giddens. I played six masses yesterday in Florida and the cantors stood next to the organ maskless. Maskless. I wore a mask through all services. You know, um, that is a little scary to me. And recently we've been getting a lot of calls from, from members who are encountering things like this. And uh, I, I'm shocked, of course, they're looking at the AGO for our stance on that. We're, we're not a union, we can't provide any rules, but um, that would seem like that would be a no-no to me <laughs> from my perspective. Alex? I, I wanna uh, sort of address, there's a couple comments related to this. And, and so I'll just address those by telling a little bit of our story. Um, we, we never stopped singing or having music. Of course, how that changed uh, throughout has been a ever evolving process. But uh, here in Texas, from the very beginning of, of the lockdown, um, the state mandates were put into place with an executive order signed by the governor that listed religious worship as an essential service. So from the very beginning, church or you know, worship, religious worship was always included as, as an essential item. So we were never really shut down. Um, our, our very first week, what we had was uh, in mass, we had the celebrant and one or two assistants and then a camera operator and myself and a quartet. And, you know, we're fortunate at the cathedral um, I'm not sure if I can, let's see, I think I can share a picture of this for you here. Yeah, your co-host, you have the ability. Let me, uh, let me just get this pulled up and then I can share it to you here. Uh, okay, here we go. So this is a, picture of our loft, which hopefully you are seeing now. And um, this is in post Christmas cleanup mode. So I apologize, it's a little uh, disorganized, but we have, um, there's two levels that are hidden off the left side between the, the center cases of the organ. And then uh, you can see there's sort of three levels choir and then there's two more levels that go down to the front of the railing uh, that can be for overflow choir or uh, sort of like an orchestra uh, pit. And so initially our very first week it was sort of these four chairs here in the front in a quartet sort of semicircle around the organ um, which puts me between 10 and 12 feet from them and and they were all six feet or, or more from each other, which was the, um, the guideline in place. And so that's sort of the method that we've all followed. And then as, as things you know, changed here locally and, and opened back up um, towards the summer, you know, we were able to have more people in and, and have a congregation back. And, but early on, it, um, recall that the the CDC did not not only not recommend that people wear a mask but also gave the instruction that people should not wear a mask I think was more intended to um, alleviate supply issues and, and things like that but we um, what we said is we asked our singers who uh, at that point in time, we're mostly college students, you know, younger um, students. And, um, but we asked everyone to, you know, self-screen for any symptoms before coming. 
and if if there were any issues, even if it were you know something that that could be a cold or or allergy, something simple, and we've kind of kept up with that. And of course, now there's um, tools like the the CDC uh, self screener and things that we ask um, anyone who's coming before they come to either rehearsal or math to go through that checklist. And if there's any concern, then to stay away. And of course, I'm, you know, you have to be more flexible with attendance and learning music and just be, be flexible. Um, but because we have such a big space in our choir loft, we can space everyone, you know, six feet apart. And, and that's sort of our limit is once we get to the point where we can't space people, then, then you know, we're at capacity, but uh, we haven't run into that problem, really. Um, the choir loft, obviously, by virtue of its height and placement in the building is distance from the congregation by quite a long ways. And, um, and the choir loft also has its own air handler in the sanctuary, which um, has a high capacity fan and, and filter and everything. So um, what we've done is uh, you can program that a little bit. We've programmed it so that while mass is happening or while we're in rehearsal, we actually rehearse in the cathedral and, and have stopped using our rehearsal space, which is a, a challenge in and of itself, but, um, but that gives us the space. So whenever we're there uh, singing, we have the, uh, the fan running which provides, you know, that, that ample circulation. And um, so there's, there's some ways that we've addressed those challenges, but I'll, I'll add one other thing that I, I read uh, just a week or so ago, um, I think from a, a school teacher, which was about the, the singing in the mask and the, the CDC's stance actually on the mask wearing is that for, uh, for singers, they, they say, their recommendation is to not wear a mask and that the social distancing is more important in that so that that everyone should be spaced you know away from each other and then while the singing happens to remove the mask and then when uh when not singing to replace it and that's sort of what we we do is when we're not singing um everyone you know puts the mask back on and and some some wear it the whole time we've never really had an issue with the optics but it's we sort of open it up to um, people's individual comfort level. And of course, there's singers who are in high risk categories because of age or um, their caretaker for someone who's in a high risk group or, or something else that, you know, they've been unable to participate. And um, we've kind of left the, you know, the invitation for, um, for choir up to people's comfort levels. So I don't know if that, I hope that's helpful to some of these questions. We have a couple more questions here. Um, and this is one that bothers me when I wear glasses. How do you handle wearing a mask while playing organ with glasses on? I try it, but the glasses always fog, fog up badly. Any, any remedies, Leslie? Um, <laughs> I, I feel your pain, whoever asked the question. Um, I have purchased a number of different masks and I finally have some um, and I'm not paid to promote them. So just keep putting that out there. The brand that works for me is called Air Queen. You can buy them on Amazon. They're disposable ones, but they've got a really good metal piece that fits down here and they fit well under the chin. And what was problematic for me, not only were my glasses fogging up, but because um, the, the straps go over your ears, then the glasses slid. If I looked down, my glasses went flying, which uh, if you're as blind as I am without them was a little bit terrifying. So these have worked much better, but it, it's definitely a challenge, not only with the glasses fogging up, but also just the whole peripheral vision of what we're used to seeing our hands do that when you have a mask on, you don't see as much in your peripheral vision. You see mask. Megan, unmute yourself. I know you wanted to say something. Sorry, just uh, when I wear glasses and wear um, my mask, uh, double-sided like clothes tape is also helpful. Just stick it right there and you're good to go. <sighs> Who would have thought we would have been talking about this a year ago? Um, 
Oh, this is to Matthew. How do you tap into pre-taped video on Zoom? So that you use the share screen function. Um, by default, although it's a setting the, um, the host can change, uh, sharing screen is reserved to co-hosts and co-hosts. And then when you click on share screen, you'll see there are two options, share sound and optimize for video clip. Uh, share sound will mean that the sound of the video as well as the uh, uh, as well as the thing itself gets shared. And then the optimization uh, optimizes um, frame rate over picture quality, I believe. So that's another important setting uh, there. I'll just chime in as well on a question that Alex already gave an answer to, Ron Ken Ken Kenreich's question about uh, a camera for the organ showing the pedals. I don't have that. There's actually someone I'm, I noticed in the attendee list here, my friend Todd Grivetti, who's in um, Herndon, Virginia, and he posts lovely photos on his Facebook page um, of him uh, with a lovely little cutout of the pedals there. So if you're interested in that, I suggest you look him up and uh, send him an email, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to tell you how he has set that up. Elizabeth, I know we had one question that came in from email, and that was, how how do you adjust, how do you cope when you are used to, as a church musician, having a large enthusiastic congregation singing when you're playing the hymns or the liturgy, and now we don't have that? And, and how do you adjust? Um, I, I know for me, that's been, it's been a challenge. I really miss that. Our congregation loves to sing and, um, you know, and, and I look forward to being able to hear them again. And we don't know when that's going to happen. When I saw this question, um, I had a laugh at Alex because we're both in Catholic churches, which is notorious for poor hymn singing. Uh, <laughs> uh, the really what happened with us is, um, we stopped with no one to sing the emphasis on you know congregational participation in that way uh, just sort of became less and less of a priority and so i think for us we made it more of a choral mass um which our singers have really enjoyed and it's been like a, a fun challenge for them so that's one way we've, we've dealt with it it's a great question i um I wanted to show a, a picture of our uh, Palm Sunday Mass here at the cathedral. And this was early on in the, uh, the lockdown process, but you can see it's such a, uh, a contrast. And there, there are other pictures uh, from Easter Vigil and some of the other, you know, things that would typically be a, a large mass here at the cathedral with, um, you know, packed to standing room only. And in this case, it's, it's really empty except for the lectors, uh, the bishop and, um, you know, assistant and camera person. And so what, uh, what we found worked, worked well is because we, um, we published the Order of worship that we print online for uh, for the congregation to go and and use while they watch the mass. And I at first I was unsure about that idea, but several of my choir members and several of the congregation wrote in to say how much they appreciated it and um, and that they and their families, you know, would would sit and watch the mass together and they'd sing together and and um, and. You know, maybe that's not everyone's experience, but there was enough of them who did that 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 we continued um, to publish that online and, and actually uh, still do for for the mass that still is streamed. But in this case, um, when the choir was here, you know, Palm Sunday um, typically is is a sort of triumphant moment, and initially we had planned to have you know brass ensemble and all these things. Um, of course, we didn't, but we uh, we kept the festive hymnody, and I just altered the registration a little bit, like I mentioned earlier, to um, reduce you know some of the great stuff, so I could keep the registration under expression, but still use sort of a, a fuller registration. And um, and we amped up the choir mics as as much as they could go, so there was still a a 
sound presence in the cathedral, but it it wasn't the same as as having a congregation. But um, you just sort of you know imagine the the people who are participating at home and uh, and then the experience that they would want to have and made it feel as as normal as we could with you know the constraints that we had and um, I think people really appreciated it and and certainly when we were able to have people back later on in the summer um, we it was during a Easter time I think the very first time we had people in the cathedral at all and we we reused some of the pieces from Easter that we did with the people and and um, I think they appreciated it all that much more. So, you know, people sang more or participated in the mass and their responses more than maybe they did before. I see uh, I, the Susan's questions here. Am I related to George Oldroyd? Um, I I don't know. I I've not been able to figure that out, but I've uh, I've had a couple people ask me, so I'll have to do some some research. Definitely uh, proud to claim the name though. Okay. Anybody else have any other? Uh, oh, looks like we got one more question here. Uh, do you enjoy that people can now hear your prelude? I do, but it has to be better now. It, it's also longer so people can join the live stream. It was, it was quite funny. Um, you know, when we record our live stream services, our pastor, we're up in the balcony in the back and our pastor said, you know, could you ask the soloist, or the cantor please, that if they need to go downstairs to either use the restroom or get a drink of water, that they please use the outside stairs because it's really distracting. Um, when they're walking through the narthex while I'm preaching. And I said, well, it's kind of like when some of you downstairs are chatting during the prelude. And he said, ah, point well taken. And it's been amazingly quiet during the prelude ever since. But uh, yes, I agree. I, I practice even more than I used to because now, you know, you know that everybody can not only hear it, but they can go back and hear it again later in the week and you want it to be really good. Uh, here's another one. Um, turning pages. Oh, we've got some comments here and I'm unable to read the chat box. Um, someone's asking, uh, do you use four, four score? Uh, turning pages without hands. Have any of you used four score for turning your head to turn pages? Um, I don't even know what that is. That's a new well, one to me. It, uh, it's interesting, the synagogue uses uh, Fourscore for, uh, and on iPads for, for pretty much everything. Uh, so in a normal high holiday cycle, uh, we have 38 iPads uh, for all the musicians involved and they're all on Fourscore. That way we create one set list and send it around, you know, to, to uh, the musicians by airdrop and it's all very easy. There are Bluetooth devices that can, you know, there are extra set of pedals to turn the pages. If I'm not mistaken, the Wanamaker organ has it built into the side of the console uh, as a Bluetooth uh, uh, page turning button, uh, but uh, it, it, it is very stable. Um, I did have the experience one year, uh, of course, at the very beginning of the Rosh Hashanah service that I pushed the button on the iPad and a little apple came up on the screen and it crashed dead in the air and it wouldn't do anything. Also, my audio monitor died at the same time. Uh, but I had my backup iPad and I could kind of hear the canter because you should always carry a spare iPad. Anyway, it, it, it's as reliable uh, a piece of machinery as the iPad is. It does crash once in a while and I, I love that I have paper in, in church and, and the uh, uh, at least that experience uh, to, to go back on. Couple more that questions. Great. I sorry. I just wanted to chime in that there's. Uh, I have a friend in in Houston who uses Fourscore with the um, with the byte switch, and because um, sometimes you don't have a a free hand for a piston or a toe for a pedal, but there's a they make another device that you you place between your teeth, and then you can 
byte and it's pressure sensitive and that turns the page and um, and he uses that for everything now. He's an organist in a, a big Catholic church there and, and loves it. So that's another uh, option if you're interested in, in turning devices. That's amazing. Uh, that's a new one on me. Um, uh, do any of you have multicultural congregations that needs a variety of congregational song and how do you accommodate this virtually? I don't I, I don't, but, but one thing I would say is even within the much narrower range of types of music my congregation did enjoy, it It had to get a lot narrower because there are just so many things you cannot, like, I mean, and, and in both directions. I mean, the fact that I can only use two singers cuts out a great deal of four-part music for one thing. Um, you know, anytime you're doing a hymn on Zoom, you're not going to, or, or with piano, that cuts out, out a lot of music. Um, you know, music in certain styles is just not going to be as practicable. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a real challenge for sure. Couple more questions here. Uh, interesting, I feel more anxiety with only a few people in the sanctuary versus a full congregation, is that somewhat a common experience? I would think so, because you're not getting any feedback. I mean, it's, um, it must be very surreal. I would think that would, that would definitely be a surreal feeling. Um, Elizabeth, there was one up that I think several popped oh, up at once. Yes whether any of the, your congregations have a virtual coffee hour after a worship service. And Matthew, I think you do, do you not? Yeah, we do. We, we randomize people into breakout rooms, um, which is actually, I, I thought I would hate, and I actually really, really like it because many of us at real coffee hour, if, as you, if you can think back that far, it's like a year ago now, uh, you the same people come up to you to talk to you and it's either people you would love to talk to and you know they're your friends and you people talk to their friends or it's people who want to make the same types of comments about the music every week you know or ask questions about it but if you're randomized into breakout rooms and you get a different like set of four four or five households every week you get you get i, I i've talked to some members of the congregation i've never talked to before and it's been really enlightening We use them at my church as well. And Leslie, I think, do you th did you say that you, you use them at your church? We No, we haven't done it for the congregation. Different groups have met via Zoom, but I really like Matthew's point that it would be a way to get people to meet and talk who might not otherwise do so. Just looking Someone has posted a question saying, how can we make Easter service special this year? And having just finished Christmas and Epiphany, we have not really talked about that yet. I, I think here in, in San Diego, we're hoping that maybe restrictions would ease and we might get to be back indoors. Um, but last year, even with live stream only, which is what it was at the time, we had a brass quartet come and play. I put them as far away from me as I could get in the balcony. And that was really almost before we knew you know, the details about, oh, you know, the, the, all the aerosols and things like that. I wore a mask the whole time. Of course, they couldn't while they were playing, but we went ahead and did it over live stream. And the person who usually funds that for us was very happy to do so. And it was really much appreciated by the congregation. So I would anticipate we're going to do that again, but it's going to be tough if we don't, if it's another Easter with no choir. You know, um, we did Holy Week here with, again, limited forces. I think it was two singers and myself. And um, I, I believe David mentioned this earlier, just you have to adapt to your situation and realize that it's not going to be like it was. And once you accept that and make it, you embrace it. And I feel like that's how you make it special in COVID times. And um, what I've noticed is as people have come back to you know, churches here is that they appreciate what they've been missing out on more. Um, so when we can all finally get back to, to normal, I think 
I think it'll be even more special. So there's ways to make it special, you know, in, in our situation. Can I uh, share something on the screen actually? Um, talking about making something special uh, that's not what we could normally do. Um, here is the uh, schedule for our high holidays this year. We, you know, we had COVID stuff that uh, we determined that singing rehearsals could only be so long and they had to have certain breaks and then you'll see the, the chamber ensemble rehearsed at different times from the from the brass and so on. Actually, what I want to show you is these layouts. So um, what's normally happening, how we, how we have a normal high holiday services is that they're jammed full of people and that's what's special about it is the whole community is gathered. Well, obviously not this year. So this is what was special is that each of these little signs represents a member of the Metropolitan Opera Brass and uh, there's a timpanist here and and there are various other instrumentalists uh, in the front so that it, it here are the quartet, the singers with about 25 feet space uh, between them and so on. And then here's the chamber orchestra layout with six feet space. Um, so it normally we, we're not able to do any of that because that whole sanctuary jam full of people. But the the sort of silver lining was we thought, you know, what what on earth can we do to make this warm and special? And we thought, well, you know, having a whole string orchestra is warm and special and it, they're where the people would normally be and we'll be showing a group of people. And and of course, that particular community, you know, string players, freelance string players, uh, had not played together mostly uh, at that time for about six or seven months. So that was a very special community experience of its own. And I think that made it across the wire to the people watching uh, that unusual services. Question here. Um... I just have one, one thing, Elizabeth, I think it's kind of, at least was very important from my perspective when we were very lucky. Um, I, I would just plan in terms of a big day like Easter and with just now Christmas to be as can have a, have a contingency plan if possible so we were really like we decided as a church to record everything we were putting out Christmas Eve we recorded everything on December the 5th and you know because actually um my my kid's nanny uh, actually the following week tested positive for coronavirus thank god she's she's well um but but of course that meant 14 day quarantine um, right after that and you know if that happens in holy week and you're planning to do everything live and you're the only organist in your congregation then that's going to be really tough so i would just say to the extent that you and the clergy and whoever you're working with can do things in advance um that's uh, it certainly is alleviate some of that anxiety. I think a lot of our members did that this year because I saw so many posts on Facebook of a glass of wine on Christmas Eve saying, I've never been able to do this in my life. It feels so strange, but I'm kind of enjoying it. <laughs> That's great. I just wanted to add one more thing uh, with that as well, how to make Easter special. And, um, Contingency plans are always a great idea. It, you know, for us, it looks a little different in the Catholic Church, um, which prohibits the use of pre recorded music. So anything that we do has to be live. And, and in the, uh, you know, in the service, I think, um, after the comments I got from Easter vigil last year, I think one of the things that people really appreciated that maybe they had sort of glossed over before were the uh, the Psalms and the Easter Vigil. Um, if you're not familiar with the Catholic Easter Vigil service, it's it's a sort of a marathon um, service which contains seven different readings, and each of those readings has a specific psalm that pairs with it, and um, and all that happens before you know anything else goes on, and um, and so we we sort of picked different settings than we had ever used before. Um, there were some settings that were sort of ingrained as, you know, this is the setting of this psalm that this congregation uses. And um, and in some cases, as, as musicians, that presents a great opportunity for us to change them when we don't necessarily find that same piece as our preferred um, piece. And um, just, just a chance to try something new and, and adjust some traditions. But I think that that's what really made uh, Easter 
I think special for us was was the choice of you know the psalm settings, which were more focused on the text, singable by a quartet of people, but still you know festive. So, um, but also uh, there's a lot of beauty and simplicity, I think too. Um, you know, trying out some different registrations on the organ. Um, you know, we didn't have brass, so uh, we used the solo reeds instead, and which didn't often do, but was able to do that. And, and it, it was effective and fun and different. And um, so just finding some, uh, you know, finding sort of the beauty in, in picking something simple or something different, I think is a great opportunity to, to make it special as well. Elizabeth, I see we have a couple of questions that have not been addressed, that we haven't talked about yet. One, uh, has anyone tried to explain to Zoom admin how they could improve their platform for choral, choral reading and choral singing? And I am not a tech expert in any sense of the word, but I think the issue is not so much the platform, but the varying internet speeds among users. And so uh, while we could talk to Zoom, I don't know that that helps unless everybody suddenly has ultra high speed internet. Um, anybody on our panel here want to chime in about that? I, I think technologically, it's, I mean, live in Silicon Valley, but I'm not a tech expert, but, but I think technologically, it, the challenge is Zoom is a video app most of all. And so it's really the issue we're talking about. I mean, it, that uses so much more bandwidth than audio only. So there are some really, really great audio things coming out that do offer zero or close to zero latency uh, that people are starting to use. One just came out of Stanford right around the corner from me here. And, and uh, I see people are having really good experiences with those, but they are audio only. So you have to use them together with um, either backing track or with Zoom, um, but just muted um, alongside those, those apps. Someone asked if any of us were doing virtual choirs, and I know the answer for me is no. Too many of my choir people just were not interested in doing that and or did not have the capability uh, to do that because they're just not very tech savvy. Anybody else? I know Megan and Alex, I would assume it's a no because of the church's prohibitions about that. Um, Matthew or David, either of you? We have done it a little. Um... It's, you know, as anyone's done it knows, it's very, very, it, it takes a long time to put together. So we've just done it for special occasions as a special thing. And uh, it's it's been enjoyable for people to sort of hear themselves sing together in that way. But, um, you know, unless you're a true, true expert um, at using all that software, it's not going to really be, uh, it, it's a lot of work for a result that's still kind of suboptimal, at least it, it, when I'm doing the editing. <laughs> We did a whole series of uh, technology uh, webinars putting choral tracks together, uh, Audacity, Band Lab, Adobe Suite, I'm trying to think of the others, uh, terms that I had never even heard of a year ago, and it, 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 it is a week long, for some people it's a week long process just to put all the tracks together to get ready for the service uh, at the end of the week. Um, it looks like we have come to the end of our webinar. Um, I think we've asked, answered most of your questions, but uh, we're going to check. And if we missed any, we will post them uh, up on the uh, page along with the recording. And I just want to thank uh, Alex and Megan and David and, and Matthew and most especially Leslie for moderating. What a great session. And to have over 200 people on this is pretty darn amazing. So thank you so very much. I'm just gonna do a couple of promos. Um, if we have chapter leaders that have uh, attended this program, there's still time to register for Leadership 2021. Uh, you can go to our home webpage and you can click through. Registration will stop on January 21st. And then I'm quite excited. This has been much awaited. On February 1st, Eastern time, we will be live streaming on Facebook Live, YouTube and Zoom. Our next webinar, Know Your Value, Introducing the AGO's New Employment Guide for Musicians. 
I know we have had a group that has been working on this, I want to say for a couple of years. So um, registration will open very shortly. And uh, I know that we will hopefully have as good an attendance as we did for this today. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Uh, my wish is for you to stay safe, stay well, and um, maybe the next time we all meet, uh, we will have all had the vaccine and maybe we'll even be meeting in person, but everybody stay safe, stay well, and thank you all for attending this webinar.